if you have your Bibles with you, uh, turn with me there to the book of Proverbs. We're looking last week a little bit at this little portion, and we really only probably got an introduction done. Uh, but I want to look at these uh, six things. Uh, it says the Lord hates, and then it says seven things are an abomination unto him. And I suppose the reason we're looking at him, some of these may be uh, harsh sentences or harsh words, uh, but yet I trust they're spoken in love. And uh, the little thought here is that they shouldn't be in the heart or that they shouldn't be in the life uh, of any individual. Because if the Lord hates something, it certainly shouldn't be in the life of his own people or even in or anything to do with their life. The little verse that always speaks to me is that little verse on keep away from every appearance of evil, that even if something looks wrong, uh, stay away from it. So we'll turn to verse 16 of Proverbs chapter 6, and just we'll read through uh, this portion here together this morning. And verse 16 says, These six things doth the Lord hate, Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. When thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is as a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. <coughs> to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. And we'll finish there at the end of verse 25 together. And we trust it'll be a blessing to us. And a little later on, just as we bring a few thoughts uh, regarding uh, those six, seven things that are there in that little portion.
Let's bow together for a short word of prayer before we turn to God's word. Dear Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you again this morning for the privilege we have of just being able to meet here together. And we thank you that you are our, our strong deliverer. And we thank you afresh this morning that you are our strong defense. And we just pray, Lord, as we come before you this morning now, as we've read your word together, we know that it shall not return unto us void. And we just pray now, Lord, as we take it up, it'll be just a word in season. It'll be a word that will just, just challenge our hearts afresh this morning to live godly lives in this present world that we're trying to live in. We know, Lord, as we look at this little thought this morning, this could be certainly a template for the evil one and a template for the world to live by. But, Lord, we thank you you've set a different template for us as believers. And we pray, Lord, even this little thought will be a help and an encouragement and just a blessing and a challenge to us this morning because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Amen. Folks, the idea behind this and looking at this little thought this morning uh, was what I said last week. If you want to turn to 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 7, 17, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it says it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And one Wearsby in his commentary has a lovely little thought on this. And he says, the scripture is profitable for doctrine. In other words, what is right? And it's good to know in the day and age we're living in what is right, isn't it? Because there's so much wrong going on around in our world today. It's good to know the difference between what is right and what is wrong. So if what is doctrine, that's what is right. And God's word will always teach us what is right. For reproof, what is not right. And folks, whatever God's word tells us that is not right, it's important. So here, I suppose this morning, is a wee word of reproof. And we can put it into that background. What is not right? And I suppose what should not be within our own hearts and within our own lives as believers. And then for correction, how to get right. And it's important to be right in the sight of God. And if you look at the little first thing, it says, six things doth God hate. These six things we're going to look at very briefly this morning, God hates. And hate is a very, very strong word. But when God said he hates something, it shows you his strength against that. So that should not be within our hearts, and it shouldn't be within our lives. So how to get right for correction, and then for instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. And this will show us how to lead our life in the world we're living in. Because it's not so much these thoughts we're going to look at the proud look and follow on from that. But what's the opposite to pride? We'll look at it in a wee minute. That's humility, isn't it? What's the opposite to a lying tongue? That is the truth. And as we go down through this little portion, we look at not only what shouldn't be in, but it reveals to us what should be in within, within our hearts and within our lives. So what is right? What is not right? How to get right? And then how to stay right in our life and in our situation. The first little thought I want to look at this morning, and I believe whether, whether this is number one or whether it's number seven, which he puts in at the end, I don't know. But I think a lot of the things which we look after actually flow from the idea of pride here. Haughty bearing, as one of the commentaries put it, I was reading, a proud look, a proud look. And if you go into the scriptures and you look through the scriptures, one of the things you would clearly see throughout the scriptures is it is not any way appropriate for pride to be within the heart and the life of the believer. In other words, the opposite to that should be always within our hearts and within our lives, and that is through humility. If you want to turn there to what, what, what pride is, there in James chapter 4 and verse 6, it says this, But he giveth more grace. But he giveth more grace. And he confers more grace to us. And we can go back to salvation, for by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're saved by his wonderful grace. That's the wonderful thing. 
And God leads us on in grace. And God gives us graces within our hearts and within our lives. I was reading this morning as I was preparing there, and I was looking at the different graces and what grace really means. And it's not just saving grace, but it's keeping grace. It's instructing grace. It's those different graces within our hearts and within our lives that will keep us truly humble. And he said he will give us more grace for each and every day of our lives. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith unto us, God resisted the proud, but he giveth grace unto the humble. And folks, if there's true humility within the heart and the life, God will add grace to that. And that grace will be evident in our lives. And there will be no such thing of pride, and there'll be no element of pride. Because the true opposite of pride is true humility. And folks, it's important in a world today, you can see pride going out through people. And folks, it's not something that the Christian should have within the heart and within the life. Folks, what you and I need to cultivate is we need to cultivate that sense of humility within our hearts and lives. If we think of where pride came from, we think of pride, it puts Satan, first of all, out of, out, out of heaven. That's where it started. He said, and if you want to turn to Isaiah 14 and 13 and, and follow on from that, it says the big reason here, because it says, for thou hast said in thine heart. That's where pride begins. It begins within the heart. And folks, if our heart is right with God, there'll be true humility within the heart. And he says, for thou hast said in thy heart, and here's what he says, I will. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne uh, above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. That's exactly what the devil said, I will be. Let's go back to the words of the Lord Jesus. Before he went to the cross to do his Father's will, he said, thy will be done. You notice the difference. You see, the devil in his pride, he was going to be as God. I will. Five times it comes back to the big eye. How many times have you spoken with people, folks, and, and you kind of switch off after a while because they say, I do this, I do that, I do the other, I'm this. You switch off, don't you? Because you hear that much of the eye, you know rightly there's pride coming out through every pore of their body. You see, what does God long within our hearts and in our <clears throat> lives? He longs for that true humility. He longs for us to be able to say like the Lord Jesus, not my will, but thy will be done. There Peter said in 1 Peter 3 and verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. And, and, and that's, the, that's the inner man. That's what's most important. That's why, that's why it says in the scripture, man looks on the outward appearance, what we look like outwardly. Can't we judge somebody very quickly by what way we look at them outwardly? But God doesn't judge anyone that way. He looks right down deep into their heart and he sees what the inner man, and he can look right into your heart and he can look right into my heart this morning and he can see exactly what we are like. That's why Peter said he looks into the inner man because on the opposite side of it, when we look at pride, it says far from within, out of the heart of man proceedeth. And folks, there's a big long list of them there that you don't want to hear. Far from within, out of the heart of man. But here it says the hidden man of heart in that which is not corruptible. In other words, there's not pride there. In other words, there's not sin there. In other words, there's cleanliness and there's godliness. And it says even the ornament. And you know when you put an ornament up, it's something that's visible. It's something that you want to, want to show off. Even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit. A calm temper, that's what that means. A contrite mind and a quiet spirit means something that is completely free from pride. And then it goes on to say, which is right in the sight of God. 
Isn't that tremendous? Because that is right in the sight of God. He goes on in 1 Peter 5 and verse 5 to say this, and be clothed with humility, for God resisted the proud. But here again we have this word, he giveth grace unto the humble. What do we need for every day to, to live our lives? We need the grace of God. What do, we need to, what do we need to be seen in our lives? We need the grace of God to be seen. And folks, I can't explain to you everything that the grace of God gives or brings within to the heart and the life of an individual. But one thing it will take away is pride. And one wonderful thing it will give is true humility. Folks, which is great in the sight of God. If you go into Matthew 11 there, Jesus describes himself as meek and lowly of spirit. And ye shall find rest for your souls. He says he is meek. He is lowly. And he took the lower part. And folks, the great challenge for you and me this morning is to know what true humility is. To take the meek and to take the lowly part. Because all of these other things, I believe, can flow out of that proud look of pride. Out of pride that's coming out of the heart and that's coming out of the life. C.H. Spurgeon on, on this little thought said this, let us be humble that we may not need to be humbled. You know, sometimes the Lord comes in and he humbles us and he takes us down a peg or two or three. And folks, he said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand that God does not have to come in and humble us, but may we be exalted, and he says again here, by the wonderful grace of God. Pride or the grace of God that brings humility into the heart and into the life. The second little thought here is, is a verbal falsehood. Here we have a, a lying tongue. And you might say, well, surely, surely Christians wouldn't tell lies. Now, folks, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm going to leave it for yourself this morning to answer it. But, you know, there's very few people at times who, who do not tell lies of some kind. And the reality here, I, I smile to myself because, because, you know, people have lies color-coordinated. And it's good to have it color-coordinated because there, there's a black lie. You don't go there at all. But there's a gray lie. You might use that at certain occasions and in certain ways. And then you have a white lie, and that doesn't really matter at all. It sure doesn't. That's, that's the way to have it. Let's color-coordinate it. We'll put them all into the different boxes. But can I say, folks... And I'm not going to be flippant this morning, but a lie is a lie. A lie is a lie. Because a lie is always the opposite of the truth. And here we have very clearly, we have a lying tongue. And you know, many people have said to me, even, even when they known who I was, they turned to me, but Mervyn, you know, it mightn't be good to tell a lie, you know, in, in our own personal life or in something like that. But it has to be all right in business. Can I say, folks, this morning very clearly, it's neither any good in your own personal life, nor it's no good in business either. You see, you have to remember where the lie comes from. The scripture talks about the father of all lies, and that's the devil. Every lie originates from him, black, white, gray, whatever color you want to put on them. That's where they come from. And yet you look at the other side. God is a God of truth. God is a God of truth. If you want to look up Psalm 146 and verse 6, it says, The Lord is God who keepeth truth forever. Not just for a short space of time, but he keeps truth and he keeps it forever. Jesus <coughs> is truth because it says very clearly in John 14 and 6, I am the way, but he's also the truth, isn't he? And he is the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. God's word is truth. There in 2 Timothy, it talks about rightly dividing. And it's important that we do that with God's word. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Even though sometimes with things we have to say mightn't be comfortable. But it's important that we rightly divide that word of truth. And then the Holy Spirit... The scripture says, the Holy Spirit, he will lead us into all truth. Truth. You see, everything to do with God, everything to do with the Trinity, everything to do with his word is always to do with the truth. 
And folks, everything else apart from the truth is a lie. There's no gray area. It's either the truth or a lie. You know, I remember years ago when I was young, I remember, now I might have carried on a wee bit and sometimes maybe did too much, but I remember one night we we had a young people's house party and, and I don't know what possessed me anyway, but that's the kind of mind I have. Somebody said to me, did you ever try a contact lens? I said, no, I've never worn one of them. Well, how long I'll put one in? So I let somebody actually put a contact lens in my eye. Now, not the brightest thing to do. Not the brightest thing to do. And I don't recommend it to anyone here this morning. If you don't have to, if they're yours, you do it. So I stuck it in. And about three o'clock in the morning, I found out we weren't going to get it out. So I said, well, where do you go at three o'clock in the morning? Any ideas? A&E. Best place to go at three o'clock in the morning. So A and E and this young doctor, he came out and he looked at me and there was, there was a pile of them around me and they were all laughing. So he got me in behind the screen anyway and he says, Mervyn, he says, uh, tell me, have you had the contact lens long? <laughs> I says, no, I haven't had it long at all. <laughs> well, I didn't tell him a lie, sure didn't. <clears throat> I hadn't the contact lens long. He said, you know, did you just put it in tonight? I says, that's right. I said, I just put it in tonight. Did you ever get trouble with the contact lens before? I says, no, I never had trouble with it before. And when I was going out the door, he was laughing. He says, Mervyn, don't put it in again tonight. I says, you needn't worry, I'll never put it in again. (laughs) Now, that's a true story. Now, I'll tell you the end of it in a wee minute. But do you know something, folks? I did not tell that fellow one lie as far as I was concerned. But can I say, I didn't tell him the truth either, sure I didn't. I didn't tell him exactly what has happened. And folks, there's a, there's a fine line sometimes between lies and truths. And that's why I always say, stay away from all appearance of evil. And you know, sometimes, oh, sorry I didn't go in the first time and says, listen, I was playing an old joke and I put it in, could you take it out? Because the same boy wouldn't have cared and he'd have just took it out anyway. But you know, about a month later, I went in for my dinner into the house. And my mother came out. Mothers, you can't fool them or you can't get away from them. And my mother, she threw out a bill for me and E for 10 euro in my name. What did you do? And then I had to own up to everything because nobody told her up to that. You see, it'll always be found out, won't it? Always be found out. That's why we keep the truth in our hearts. The third little thought here very quickly is heartless cruelty. Hands that shed innocent blood, innocent blood. And if you took up that element from scripture, folks, it's, it's to take a life. It's simply to take a life. Now, you might say here, folks, listen, we would never go that description. We would never think of ever taking a life. <coughs> life is something that's sacred. And I know there's different illustrations we can go into. Thou shalt not kill, you know. But, but I want to look at the idea of Cain and Abel. Because we know Cain took his brother Abel's life. And if you want to turn with me there to 1 John 3. And if you go into verses 11 through to 15 in 1 John 3. This is what it says. And and the end of verse 11 it says that ye should love one another. And Christ is explaining how you love one another. And he's explaining that we, we have a love one for another. As Christ loved us, we are to love one another. Verse 12 says, not as Cain. And he uses the description of Cain who took his brother Abel's life. Who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And where, wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Go down to verse 15. And it says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer shall have eternal life abiding in him. Now, folks, that puts puts a different topic on it, doesn't it? And, And I think, you know, if you look at the word hate, it says this, to feel intense dislike for someone. Or something. To feel intense dislike for someone or something. 
And even in this little portion here, he brings it that hatred and murder are the very same. Are the very same. And you might say to me, well, Merfin, they couldn't be even in a shout of each other. And it says somebody who hates somebody with that intensity, they might as well take their life. And you know, if you look around the world, and this is why I want to take it, and you look at some of the murders that were committed, it was hatred that led to murder. Bitterness, whether political, whether other things, I'm not going to go into it this morning. But you know, eventually it got to the place of taking a life. And sometimes even they will justify taking a life. And that's a sad reality, I believe. And folks, that's why we should not have hatred. We should have loved one for another. What did Jesus say about those who were going to put him on the cross and take his life? You can go in, I think it's in Luke's gospel, is it Luke 23? And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And folks, even as Christians, if we're able to say, listen, we're not going to have hate, but we're going to forgive. And folks, that'll bring blessing even into our own hearts. And it'll bring blessing into our own lives. The fourth little thought here uh, is, is vicious, vicious scheming. If you go into there in verse 18, it says, a heart that devised wicked imaginations. Uh, and here is a reminder of, 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 of the very source of evil. Because at, you'll notice we go back to the heart. We go back to the heart. And I believe the heart of the individual is the most important thing. It comes from inside. There in Matthew 15, 18, and 19, it says, But these things which proceeded out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. They defile the man. One of the commentaries I was reading there during last week said this. It says, Man is an inventor, and he's always inventing evil things. Man is an inventor, and he's always inventing evil evil things and folks where does it come from it comes from the heart it comes from the heart scheming scheming it says here a heart that devises at wicked imaginations and you know you see and you hear some of the things that men devise and women devise and you think to yourself how can they devise them where does it come from it comes from the evil within i was thinking of that lovely little hymn which is the opposite I want, dear Lord, a heart that's true and clean. A sunlit heart with not a cloud between. A heart like thine, a heart divine. A heart as white as snow. On me, dear Lord, a heart like this bestow. The second verse says, I want, dear Lord, a love that feels for all. A deep, strong love that answers every call. And you know, when we look at the heart, when we look at devising evil, you know, if there's love within the heart, folks, and if the Lord is within our hearts, there's different devising that goes out. It's a devising of love. It's a devising of help. It's a devising of comfort. And I want to leave two people with you very quickly because time is going on. If you look at Dorcas there in Acts 9 and 36, what is said about this woman? It said of Dorcas there, this woman was filled with good works and alms deeds. That's acts of kindness. She was filling with good works. She was filled with acts of kindness, which she did. I wonder, could that be saying about you and me? Not our heart devising wicked imagination, but the heart filled with good things. The heart filled with kindness. That's exactly what the opposite is. And then the second one is how different it was for Barnabas. If you look at Barnabas there, go to Acts 11 and 24. He says he was a good man. He was full of the Holy Ghost. And he was full of faith. Isn't it tremendous? He was a good man. He was a good man. Dorcas was a good woman. And you and I need to be good men and good women. And not going with the heart devising wicked imaginations like it says here. Moving on, the fifth little thought here. It says, feet that be swift to running to mischief. 
And I suppose that this is mischievous eagerness. You know, sometimes people that go running to, to evil. And you know the thing I thought of here? I, I like watching the rugby at times. But you know, I, I suppose I, I watch it sometimes that there can be a little a disagreement arise. We'll put it that way in the rugby field. But the one thing I notice, no matter where they are, they all come in for that little disagreement and a wee chat in the middle of the field together. And, but there was one fellow one day, he was a wee small fellow, and he was number 15, he was way down the back. If anybody plays 15, sorry, but this was a wee fellow. And he came running from the far end of the field to get into the middle of this disagreement. Now, there was boys that height, and he was only that height. I don't know what he was doing running in. And the ref grabbed him by the collar, collar of the shirt, and he pulled him back. He says, will you go back to where you were? I don't know what you're doing in here. And he pushed him and sent him away. But I just thought when I read this, you know, he was actually running to get into the middle of it where he shouldn't have been anywhere near it at all. And sometimes when we see something wrong, we're, we're drawn to it, aren't we? We're drawn to it. We all want to see. Why is there so many accidents happen beside accidents? Because we're all nosy. Isn't that right? We all want to see. And you know, when there's something going on, we all want to run to it. But can I ask you this morning, what are your feet doing? Are your feet running to mischief, like it says here? Or are your feet beautiful feet? You see the beautiful feet here in Scripture in Romans 10 and 15. It says, how beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I wonder, folks, when it comes to preach the gospel, I wonder when it comes to share the gospel, are our feet running to do the same? Are our feet running to do the same? Are our feet out around the doors to say, listen, here's a wee invite to come? Are our feet away to our neighbor's house to say, listen, here's a wee invitation for you, come? There's a mission on. You invite your, your folks along, but that's what our feet should be at. And the word of God says there in one of my favorite verses in, in, in Psalm 119 and verse 101, and you all know it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You see, there's the footwork and there's the path altogether. And God's word will always lead us away from mischief and lead us into sharing the gospel with those we come in contact with. The sixth little thought here very quickly, social slander. There in, there in verse 19, it says, a false witness that speaketh lies. And I'm not going to go into this much this morning, but, but really we have the idea of gossip. We have the idea of slander here. Uh, and I, I read a quotation there in gossip. It says, and, and I thought it was interesting and it stuck my mind because it said gossip, it, it's like mud thrown against a clean wall. It may not stick, but it leaves a mark. It's like mud thrown against a clean wall. It may not stick, but it leaves a mark. Now, I was up, I used to walk around the Royal. You're not allowed to walk anymore now because you're not allowed to walk with the dog, so I don't go up there anymore now, so don't be saying I do. I'm just making a broadcast here so somebody else to see. But, you know, I remember I used to go up and I looked at the wall down there, and sometimes when, when the mud was there and everything was going, the young ones used to, to fire mud again the wall. And I used to watch it, and, and you did watch it. And you, you saw the bits of mud stuck, and then after a while the mud fell off. But there was always a mark there left until it was repainted. It was always left there. And I thought, you know, that illustrates gossip, doesn't it? It leaves a mark, and it leaves a dangerous mark behind it. I read a story many years ago, many of you will know of, of Dr. David Livingston, who went out as a missionary to Africa. Wonderful man of God. David Livingston was married before he went to Africa, but David Livingston's wife was someone who was, who was very, very poorly. Uh, she never kept well. She wasn't supposed to go to Africa. And the doctor told her, he says, if you go to Africa, you'll die. So she stayed at home and she looked after all his details and all his correspondence, sent him out food and looked after all his needs. But you know, a rumor started going up and it started to say that they had a bad marriage. Well, if she was a good wife, she'd be out there beside him in Africa and she should go. 
And after a while, these rumors got back to her. And as these rumors got back to her, after a wee while, you know what she did? She packed up all her belongings and she headed to Africa. But within two years, she was buried in Africa. In Africa. The wee bit of mud. The wee bit of mud. It always leaves a sticking. The last little thought here is my time is well gone, folks. Divisive strife. And I can't leave it out because it says, He that soweth discord among the brethren. He that soweth discord among the brethren. And folks, one thing that saddens me at times is, is discord sometimes within church life. A split that has happened in a particular church. And folks, it doesn't do anyone any good. It doesn't do anyone any good. And you know, folks, I've heard in church life's just completely split. I've heard of two churches starting up. You know, even in our own denomination, there's two churches, one in the church and one in the hall that meets together. And you know, it's very, very sad. That's very sad. And you know, one thing the Lord says, where the brethren dwell together in unity, there the Lord commands a blessing. And folks, that's what we long for in these days, that we know that wonderful unity amongst us that the Lord will come in amongst us and he'll have his own way. And can I say, in the church as a whole, that the church of God will know unity because that will bring great blessing. And, and folks, that's really what we need today. You know, as I finish this little thought, can I say, not for one minute am I saying that these things are within the heart or the life of anybody here this morning. Please don't ever think that. But I'm asking you, just check your own heart. We'll go to the Lord's table in a wee minute. And that little portion we're going to read this morning just simply says, let a man examine himself. And it's good to search our hearts before God. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We search our own hearts before God. And we make sure we have a heart that is clean, a heart that is pure, and a heart that is right with and before.